for that. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I will speak in English because uh, energy for sustainability is an uh, uh, international uh, initiative. Okay, it's an initiative from the University of Cleaver, but uh, in our master and PhD program, we have uh, foreign students, and so uh, everything runs in, in English. Uh, so today we have the, the research day, and we are taking profit of this opportunity to uh, have a, a lecture uh, for, from Professor Tony Martins, who was the first coordinator of the, the initiative. And this is not only a lecture, it's also uh, a session dedicated to, to it. Uh, okay, uh, let me only uh, give a few words. Uh, I think uh, I, I have already used this sentence, but uh, it is uh, like, uh, for me, one of the best sentences uh, to tell what was the, the role of uh, Professor Antonio Martins in, in this initiative. And it's a sentence uh, from uh, John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Okay, sometimes it is quoted to someone, and sometimes to Yoko Ono, and sometimes to the to the cat. Of course, we know from the history of rock that they together sure had some inspirational moments. And <laughs> this, this is, I think, one of the best. And the sentence is, a dream you dream alone is just a dream. A dream you dream together is a reality. And uh, I think this initiative uh, was a dream of Professor Antonio Martins. And we were quite lucky that he decided to share the dream with us, and it became a reality. And, okay, just another sentence about the uh, personality of Antoine Bertins. Uh, it's a sentence I saw written in Italy in an exhibition about, uh, let's like say, uh, it was uh, about uh, fashion, the exhibition, in uh, the city of Matera. And uh, it was written, L'eleganza uh, è una questione morale. And so, <laughs> the, the elegance is a, a moral question. And I think uh, when we talk about Antonio Martins, this elegance is not only the physical elegance, that is quite evidence, <laughs> but it's also a question of the, let us say, the, the interpersonal relationship that is uh, always quite elegant. Okay, a bit towards my time. Uh, so now I will give uh, the floor to uh, Vice Rector Professor Claudia Cavada. Uh, okay, this is a, a little bit against the protocol, but uh, on account of her agenda, she should be in a, in a meeting representing the university. The university. Uh, so, uh, and after we will have uh, Professor Sierra Santos, and next, a few videos with uh, some testimonies of the people who know uh, Antoine Martins. for the University of Coimbra, and I, I have the words from the directors 
uh, he told me, please tell them that it's very important the research that they are being doing and also the PhD students. So re really, these 14 years of EFS are really very relevant. So this interdisciplinarity is really the hub of our uh, university. So it's really very important. So uh, this is the words of the lecture. Now I will change to Portuguese because in English I cannot talk with my heart.
Boa tarde a todos. Uh, I've not been told that I should speak in English. I was not prepared for that. So I think that I will speak in Portuguese. I'm sorry. Um, começo por fazer uma declaração de intenções. Não sou, com certeza, a melhor pessoa para uh, dizer umas breves palavras sobre o António Luís Martins. Por razões uh, objetivas e por razões subjetivas. Muitos dos que aqui estão partilharam uh, 40 anos, 45 anos de trabalho, se começarmos no tempo em que anos entramos na universidade, uh, com ele. Eu apenas partilhei uma pequena parte desse tempo. Uh, de outro departamento, distante, uh, no polo 1, vamos dizer 200 metros, aqui no polo 2, vamos dizer 200 metros, todos sabemos que 200 metros numa universidade é uma infinidade, é muita distância. Uh, os departamentos estão todos muito distantes uns dos outros. Um, e um, distantes como estávamos e como estamos em termos profissionais de 200 metros, uh, isso uh, tornou difícil que fizéssemos um percurso com uh, aproximação diária com muitos de vocês aqui têm dele. Uh, não sou, portanto, a melhor pessoa em termos objetivos para partilhar convosco a impressão que me deixam estes 40 e tal anos de aproximação do António Martins. Só partilhei com ele uh, curtos intervalos no princípio da nossa, vamos dizer, carreira, melhor dizendo, percurso universitário, ambos estudantes, e depois, lá mais para meio, uh, vamos dizer, três quartos desse percurso, uma intensa, uh, uh, um intenso período, com uma intensa atividade de cerca de 28 anos, em que ambos estivemos na reitoria da Universidade de Coimbra. Por razões subjetivas também, porque uh, esse tempo foi tão intenso e essa amizade forjada em tantas horas, tantas centenas, tantas, tantos milhares de horas de trabalho, de, de pestanas queimadas, de preocupação comum e conjunta sobre de que forma agir, como ultrapassar os problemas, como encarar a realidade. Foram tantas e tão fortes que me uh, unem a ele laços de profunda amizade uh, e isso torna naturalmente difícil que ele fale de uma forma independente e objetiva sobre o António Gomes Martins. Estudantes, jovens estudantes, partilhámos na Clepsida e na Associação Académica de Coimbra os primeiros momentos da nossa vida universitária. Realmente, a Universidade de Coimbra é muito mais do que as salas de aula da Universidade de Coimbra. É praticamente toda a cidade, em todo caso, toda aquela zona da alta, na altura, agora, outras zonas também da cidade, em que os estudantes se juntavam, se partilhavam as suas preocupações, as suas ideias, na altura vibrante eh, que eh, vocês imaginam que começámos em 1971, 72 e depois apanhámos a meio eh, a Revolução, eh, em 74, e depois apanhámos 75, 76, os anos seguintes. Portanto, todo esse ambiente universitário de uma eh, cidade, de um país e de uma academia em efervescência foi esse o caldo que nos proporcionou a mim e ele e a muitos outros, a muitas centenas de outros jovens estudantes. Éramos cerca de 10 mil em Coimbra na altura, talvez um pouco mais já, já nessa época. Um, uh, essa, essa entrosamento, essa aproximação, essa, essa cumplicidade. Estou aqui a ver um, um, um feedback -zito. se fosse possível tirar isto dos ouvidos. Isso mesmo. Um, uh, essa cumplicidade, essa aproximação, essa vivência conjunta dos problemas e das aspirações da juventude que fez de nós uh, amigos uh, uh, inseparáveis. Apesar da separação dos 200 metros que foi há pouco. Depois, mais tarde, mais tarde, mais tarde, ainda nessa altura, não só na Eclepsida, apesar de tudo, mas também na Associação Académica. Na Associação Académica, em que ele chegou a ser e foi eleito Presidente da Direção-Geral, se não estou erro, na segunda direção eleita à Senhora de Abril. Estamos a falar de 76, 77? 75, 76. Um, e eu, membro também suplente dessa direção, e portanto, nesse período em que 28 jovens estudantes passavam as noites, basicamente, e os dias, porque nessa altura não se dormia, a pensar no que iria ser a Academia do Futuro e a, e a, e a, e a evolução desta associação, desta, dessa associação académica, que era por todos muito querida e ainda por todos muito respeitada. Depois, mais tarde, veio um período em que partilhámos as, as funções de, 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 de governo da Universidade. Um, uh, éramos uma equipe pequena, de um reitor e quatro vice-reitores, e ele uh, acumulava as funções mais pesadas 
da responsabilidade administrativa e da responsabilidade académica. Portanto, foi uma época em que uh, se entendeu de verificar uh, debaixo de uma alçada de uma única pessoa a responsabilidade deste conjunto administrativo global da Universidade de Lima para termos uma visão integrada de todos os, 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 os assuntos respeitantes à, à, à vida, digamos, à, à gestão dos, dos, da vida corrente, do pulsar da Universidade. Uh, e, e eu penso que dificilmente a Universidade encontrará outra pessoa uh, no passado, no presente ou no futuro, sem desprimor de ninguém, porque eu começo por me incluir a mim próprio nessas funções que tinha desempenhado antes dele a desempenhar a partir de 2003, uh, não encontrará com facilidade outra pessoa que, com a mesma competência, a mesma capacidade de estudar os assuntos, a mesma organização, uh, uh, a mesma capacidade de sistematizar uh, no seu espírito uh, as, as várias questões que estavam sob a sua alçada. Lembro-me que uma vez disse que ele tinha um espírito geométrico, ele mostrou. Uh, eu esqueci-me de dizer, e aproveito para lhe dizer agora, que ele alia esse espírito geométrico a uma uh, a cultura vulgar, a uma capacidade extraordinária de relacionamento humano, de, de uh, cultura humanística, capacidade de se relacionar com os outros. Eu penso que não haverá ninguém que tenha cruzado a vida pessoal ou profissional como os Martins que possa ter uma ideia diferente dele. Não imagino uh, altercar-se com alguém, a levantar a voz com quem quer que seja, imagino a respeitar a opinião dos outros, a ouvir os outros, a ter uma capacidade de lugar para conciliar, para, para, para um, contextualizar, para aproximar as pessoas e penso que esta iniciativa que nós aqui hoje celebramos uh, é também uma prova disso mesmo. Na leitoria, um, Fez muitas coisas por iniciativa própria, claro que estes meios e minutos não, não me dão nem de longe nem de perto para recordar. Digo-vos apenas, porque troquei há bocadinho impressões com ele, ele me ajudou a avivar a memória. Digo-vos apenas que eh, foi em 2007 que, pela primeira vez, a Universidade teve capacidade para distribuir eh, o seu orçamento interno de uma forma diferente das regras que vinham de Lisboa. Eu tinha introduzido Imaginem como isto é. Em 98, quando entrei na reitoria, fizemos o primeiro orçamento através de uma folha Excel. Anteriormente, aquilo era feito mais ou menos por negociação direta entre o diretor das faculdades e o diretor do corpo, e saía aquilo que saía, quem tinha mais peso levava mais dinheiro, quem tinha braços mais musculados fazia valer mais os seus argumentos, e era assim que as coisas passavam. Portanto, só em 98, final do século XX, é que a Universidade de Coimbra acedeu a uma primeira fórmula, digamos, objetiva, minimamente objetiva, em função de, não só de muitos estudantes, mas de muitos outros parâmetros de distribuição orçamental. E foi preciso esperar eh, mais de 10 anos, quase 10 anos, já com o António Luís Martins, para nós nos libertarmos dos critérios que vinham de Lisboa eh, e para sermos capazes internamente, através de um trabalho que só ele podia ter conseguido concretizar dentro desta Universidade complexa, com tantas sensibilidades, com oito unidades orgânicas na altura, que eh, cada uma naturalmente dirimia os seus argumentos, só o ele é que tinha capacidade para conciliar, para ouvir, para propor coisas que se fossem pontos de contacto e de aproximação entre as, essas várias sensibilidades. Portanto, eh, foi em 2007 que nós tivemos pela primeira vez essa oportunidade. Em 2007 também, incluído nesse, nesse percurso, nesse, nesse processo, a possibilidade de dotar pela primeira vez o 3 e o Colégio das Artes, com um orçamento, apesar de eh, formalmente não haver eh, professores eh, associados a essas unidades orgânicas e essas unidades orgânicas receberem a contribuição de professores de outras unidades orgânicas. Portanto, foi um trabalho eh, exemplar, eh, tal como a introdução da contabilidade analítica, que é uma contabilidade que permite às empresas saber, eh, digamos, às quantas andam, quanto é que custa cada um dos projetos. Em Coimbra não havia isto, devo dizer que ainda hoje, Uh, não, se não estou em erro, posso estar enganado e posso não estar atualizado, mas penso ter a certeza de, de, de afirmar que ainda hoje não há mais nenhuma instituição de ensino superior que tenha contabilidade analítica organizada, uh, tal como nós a pusemos a funcionar uh, por essa altura na Universidade de Coimbra. Era um salto uh, enorme e era um salto que uh, não havia muita, uh, muitos organismos da administração pública capazes de fazer e que permitia à Universidade ir uh, concorrer aos juntos europeus a custos uh, totais. E, portanto, isso era uma mais-valia, era uma, uma forma também de integrar as unidades não universitárias privadas sem fins lucrativos de investigação científica, as maiores das quais eram, como sabem, o, o ISAM, o CNC e o SES, mas algumas outras também, o ISR, o INESP e várias outras. 
uh, o IT e várias outras. Portanto, era a possibilidade também de agregar essas unidades, essas unidades e trazê-las para, uh, digamos, a, a perímetro contabilístico da Universidade de Coimbra e fazer com que tudo isto contasse e com, e com que tudo isto valesse para, 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 para definir a dimensão desta instituição. Foi também que, nas mãos dele, tivemos o primeiro regulamento académico válido para toda a Universidade. Uh, uh, foi pelas mãos dele que tivemos a primeira plataforma informática para a organização da atividade académica. Uma coisa que se chamava Web on Campus e que em muita medida, em larga medida, foi precursora do atual Nónio, que é de facto uma ferramenta notável, que entra de forma diversa nas várias unidades orgânicas. Como todos percebemos, não é propriamente o um programa que resolve os problemas, é preciso que haja uma cultura instalada que permita interpretar o programa e utilizá-lo rapidamente. E, em boa medida, o, o, o êxito que o Nónio teve em, vamos dizer, quase toda a universidade, sobretudo na Faculdade de Ciência e Tecnologia, deve-se ao facto de ter sido percebido de outras plataformas que fizeram o caminho e que prepararam a cultura, as pessoas e, as, e, a, e os departamentos. Hum, Lembro-me de uma vez entrar na reitoria e ver uma longa lista de estudantes do primeiro ano, estávamos por esta altura, talvez no princípio de setembro, não, na altura no princípio de outubro, as aulas começavam mais tarde, ou talvez até mais tarde, uma longa lista pela rua de ida acima até aos serviços académicos, estudantes do primeiro ano que se iam inscrever. Eu achei aquilo, que aquilo era um bocado terceiro mundista, confessámos os dois, e ele disse não, o último ano é que isto acontece. De facto, no ano seguinte, tínhamos uma tenda uh, que ocupava praticamente metade do, do, do pátio das escolas, uma tenda branca, uh, no interior da qual havia vários guichés, dezenas de guichés, com funcionários da universidade a atenderem de uma forma personalizada os estudantes que entravam e tinham ali assim uh, uma espécie de guichê único de, 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 de loja do cidadão universitário, tudo aquilo que precisavam para resolver os seus problemas rapidamente e de uma forma, digamos, moderna, de uma forma atual, de uma forma europeia. Um, Lembro-me que foi para as mãos dele que tivemos pela primeira vez a, mesma, a, a primeira ação organizada a nível da comunicação. Era eu responsável pela, pelo site da Universidade de Coimbra, foi ele que promoveu uma grande renovação em 2007, que depois começou a fazer uma outra ainda mais profunda que se concretizou em 2010. Uh, tivemos durante todo este percurso as primeiras páginas, as primeiras linhas, os primeiros lugares na visibilidade mediática da Universidade no território, digamos, no contexto nacional, a nível de ensino superior, sem sombra de dúvida, mantínhamos regularmente essa contabilidade e, de facto, ficamos a ver isso com António Gomes Martins. E depois o Triasis. O Triasis já vinha atrás, é verdade, foi feito numa altura em que, enfim, titubeantemente se procurava encontrar laços e criar possibilidades de interligação entre os vários departamentos de investigação científica dos vários departamentos da Universidade de Coimbra, das várias faculdades. O Tresis apareceu uh, uh, ainda numa fase em que tudo isso era muito, muito titubeante, muito rudimentar e foi progressivamente adquirindo uma, uma importância que uh, chega ao momento, uh, aos dias de hoje. Uh, foi numa segunda fase transformada em unidade orgânica, logo em 2003, e depois numa terceira fase, já uh, depois da, da publicação dos GES, foi com o António Gomes Martins que se criou o primeiro estatuto do Tresis, que se transformou o Tresis em escola doutoral, do da qual ele foi o primeiro uh, diretor, suponho que é diretor, diretor. Foi o Gomes Martins que, na Universidade de Coimbra, uh, liderou todo o processo administrativo resultante da, 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 da aplicação dos GES e de toda a reforma dos anos loucos, 2007 a 2010. Foram três anos de Uh, processo de Bolonha, de Regiés, de qualidade, de, 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 de processos de, de gestão da qualidade, que aliás, uh, em, no aspecto em que aliás fomos igualmente precursores, fomos uh, a primeira universidade a ter os serviços certificados pela norma uh, 9001, uh, fomos a primeira universidade a ter os serviços, uh, digamos, a ter uma, um departamento de, de, de avaliação interna, de controle do desempenho, da de assessoria interna da qualidade, uh, se há mágoa que esses dias me deixam, os Martins, são dois tipos. Um é de perceber que é tão fácil desmontar aquilo que foi organizado. A segunda é que, desgraçado o país em que nós vivemos, não é capaz de aproveitar as pessoas como tu. 
Marés Pinhos, do Namora, só para falar em ministros da tua área de trabalho, uh, não os conseguem aproveitar na justa medida das suas responsabilidades. Obrigado a todos.
de Ricardo Rodrigues do, do grupo da direita. Foi muito gosto porque aceitei dizer nos breves palavras sobre o professor António Lemos Martins nesta merecida homenagem da Universidade de Coimbra. A minha relação com o professor Lemos Martins foi essencialmente uma relação institucional. Enquanto representante da indústria, em parcerias com a Universidade de Coimbra e, em particular, a iniciativa Energy for Sustainability e também uma breve passagem pelo Conselho Geral da Universidade de Coimbra. O professor Gomes Martins é verdadeiramente um gentleman com muito bom senso e facilitador e promotor de consenso. Uh, muito importantes quando é necessário conciliar uh, vários interesses entre as partes. É um homem de grande uh, seriedade e um incontornável defensor e dinamizador da Universidade de Coimbra e das parcerias uh, Universidade Indústria. Desejo-lhe as maiores uh, felicidades para esta nova fase e etapa da sua vida. Deixando formalmente a Universidade de Coimbra, mas naturalmente eh, estará disponível sempre para ajudar eh, a Universidade. Uh, também enquanto és uh, o antigo aluno da, da Universidade de Coimbra, uh, quero aqui uh, deixar uh, o meu muito obrigado uh, pelos seus contributos pela, na defesa e dinamização da Universidade. Muito obrigado, um grande abraço. E até breve, até sempre. Eu acho que temos que aplaudir. Research, and then perform an extensive research, literature research. 
uh, with the aim of finding uh, knowledge gaps or problems not yet solved, and then um, after collecting those gaps or those problems, define an objective. And according to that objective, uh, define a path, uh, which has to um, be well, which has to enable them to answer a set of research questions, which have, they have to formulate. Once identified the objective, they have research questions they have to, to, to formulate, and they should be able, in the end, to, um, to answer those questions, right? So, um, sorry, I'm just putting in the hours of it, I don't, don't extend myself too much. Um, and in the end, when they write their thesis, they should be able, in the end, I mean, the final parts of the conclusion parts of, of the thesis, they should be able to, you know, uh, list the research questions with their, correct, with their respective uh, answers they found in their research. So, this is not the same thing. I mean, when, when I call research questions to the title of my speech, it was kind of a bait to capture their attention, not exactly because they are formally research questions, right? So they're, Basically, you, you will judge for yourself, but uh, they're basically things that uh, worry me one, one way or the other. Some of them may actually correspond to um, good or useful research questions. And if, if they are, well, they are really corresponding to a lot of work. Uh, if, if you want to answer some of them, it's, it's going to be difficult. In, in, in many cases, they correspond to qualitative research not only quantitative, but qualitative research, which is good because FS is interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary, so it should uh, uh, encompass everything, qualitative and quantitative research. So, really, it's because, okay. Now, my first research question is, um, it's, it's a broad one. I mean, uh, this, this is one of the difficult ones, right? Uh, how far are we from 100% renewable energy supplying all the uses? Um, I should give, if someone is interested in this research he, he or she should have a context, and you know, I'm going to um, give you some context, my personal view on this context, so that it will be useful for them. I mean, most of you must have known about the, the Hubert's uh, prediction of the oil consumption in the United States. It has been generalized to fossil fuels in general all over the world, so fossil fuels are finite in nature, so there must be some kind of uh, similar form to this one for the existence or exploitation of the uh, resources. The real curve is a little bit different because of the fracking uh, technology in the United States for exploring the oil, which would be new opportunities, but mostly this is okay. Um, according to the IPCC, we should, if we want to comply with the objective of 1.5 degrees centigrade of uh, temperature rates, we should uh, limit ourselves to using partially, only partially, the, the known reserves. And the known reserves are unknown because, you know, all the time is happening, um, new reserves to, to be found somewhere, so reserves are always evolving. But anyway, those who are known at this date in particular are 746 uh, times 10 raised to 9 tons of, uh, tons of, uh, tons of carbon. You should, if you want to comply with 1.5 degrees centigrade uh, temperature rates, you should only use a part of it, right? In, in this case, it's 2 degrees centigrade, not even 1.5 degrees. Right? Mm -hmm. So, this means that either because they exhaust or because we all lie before we exhaust them, right? Um, uh, they will they will end, anyway. Um, a, a professor of, of, the, of the UCSD has an interesting article in, in a blog that he created. Um, about the the, um, the use of fossil fuels. This is not new. I suppose everyone, well, almost everyone among you knows this particular diagram. Eventually, with a with a, a wider time scale, even even wider, with some millions of years before and some millions of years after, and, and only a spike corresponding to the use of fossil fuels right, in, in, the, in the history of Earth. So we have several millions of years where the Earth stored um, this is energy storage store fossil fuels, and then we are using them at, at a rate which is um, what it is. I mean, the, that particular um, rate star is where we stand right now, more or less. Um, so what happens after these is exhausted, if we want to continue using 
the same standard of life that we have up to now, right? So these means that as a first assumption, we should be able to, to have renewable resources at the same level of usage that we will have at the peak of the fossil fuel resources, right? Um, but the, the question is, if you look at the seventh um, objective of sustainable development, the, the seventh um, sustainable development, the, S, the, the OSD corresponding to energy, it says, ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all, right? So this means it for all people. People living in developing countries or in developed countries. What we expect is that people in developing countries have aspirations to a higher uh, standard of living. And so, even if we raise uh, enormously the efficiency of energy use, this will correspond necessarily to a, a, a growth of energy use in general terms. So, this is why Thomas Murphy said that, well, he said, well, probably if you compare um, the least developed with the United States citizen, uh, with per capita consumption of the United States citizen, we should need ten times, tenfold what will, what will happen in, in the end, right? Because if everyone raises the standard of life to the life to the average standard of life of the United States, it will correspond to ten times what we have now. Uh, but, well, okay, let's, let's suppose that efficiency will downgrade that. Uh, as a factor of two, so five times will be needed. Even if you don't agree with this, because this is this is obvious. I mean, if I, either you increase very enormously efficiency in energy use, or you just don't respect the seventh objective, um, it will be inevitable to have a much higher uh, energy use than, than you have now, or than, it, than you will have in the end of the fossil fuel era. Uh, if we look at the, um, uh, well, it, it's more it's a buzzword now. I mean, we should electrify the country, right? Everyone has heard about this uh, by now. Why should we electrify the country? Because uh, electricity is the energy form which is more easily prone to be generated from a primary, um, a primary renewable energy, right? So it's easy, which is electricity now from the wind or from solar radiation in several forms, but electricity is the easiest one. Uh, so, electrifying the economy may be a good solution. Why, why, why don't we follow that and, and try to increase as much as possible the share of renewable sources at, at primary level to produce electricity? If we look at what happens in 2018, this is International Energy Agency uh, numbers, very recent. Um, if you look at 2018, you will see that electricity uh, corresponds to a more or less 20% of final energy use in, in the world, right? Um, if you look at how that electricity is generated, you will, you will see that um, renewable energy corresponds to more or less 25%, of the quarter of electricity is generated from, um, from renewable sources. If you add nuclear, which is not renewable, but it's not polluted, does it generate greenhouse gas emissions? So it, it is 35%. If you go back to 20%, I mean 25% of 20, you, you know how much is it, right? So it's 5%. Only renewables. It's 5% of total final energy use. If you increase to nuclear, if you consider nuclear, it's 7%. So our point of departure in 2018 for the electrification of the economy towards the goal of having everything renewable because in the end of the fossil fuel we have to have everything renewable. It will be um, from five or from seven to whatever. We will see that later. Um, so let's just some, do some back of the envelope exercises. Um, th these tables show us the numbers that you saw in the graph. Uh, so, um, these are the rate of growth. If you calculate the rate of growth from the, the 1973 to 2018 figures, these are the, the, the average annual rate of growth of consumption. As you can see, electricity grows at more or less twice the speed that total final energy consumption grows. So we would expect that sometime in the future, electricity will, will be able to supply eventually a vast majority of the total final energy consumption, right? If everything remains. Uh, this is uh, the, the Population figures gives us this uh, consumption per capita, so this is just a reference. So if you make some assumptions, and if if you 
consider that if you want to comply with the seventh uh, sustainable development objective, you consider that well, we are going to raise the energy efficiency so much that you consider uh, it is possible to maintain the, the, the consumption per capita uh, as it is in 2018. Let us suppose. And then let us suppose that biofuels and waste, which are renewable, uh, keep the same rate of growth in the future. Electricity keeps the same rate of growth. So where does electricity uh, fill the gap between biofuels and waste and total final energy consumption uh, in 2073? This means that, if you look at it, uh, that many applications in the industry, heat applications in the which require gauges or liquid fuels, um, will be supplied through electricity. Electricity will be used to, um, either through electrolysis, for instance, or through um, fuel synthesis in several different forms. It will be able to provide the gauges and liquid fuels that are needed in industry for heat applications. So electricity will be the basis for everything in this particular set of, of, of assumptions, right? And with the particular assumption as well that all these conversions will be made with 100% 100 efficiency, which is completely unlikely, right? Uh, and, and that would be in 2073, right? Um, well, sorry. Um, this means that um, the, the share of each one will, will be this. I mean, if those advice will raise in, in the yellow line, and will in the, in the red line, and the sum of those two will, will comply with the, the, the energy needs of order. Which is more or less approximately the better move the Paris Agreement goes. Because they say, well, um, we should be able to decrease revenue to global zero. Uh, emissions and, uh, in 2017. Uh, if you look at the assumptions I made, which are completely unrealistic to reach 2074, you can you can look at this in, from from a, a more realistic uh, point of view, right? If all the electricity was generated with non-fossil primary energy, right? uh, which is not in, in the other assumptions. Um, if we want to be even more ambitious, if we want to decarbonize to just in 2050, then we could ask the reverse question. I mean, considering the same the same uh, assumptions, then um, if we consider that electricity supplies in 2050 all the remaining needs that biofuels and waste are not able to supply, then you would have to have a, a, a rate of growth of 5.68%. Again, considering that electricity will provide the heat. Uh, through generation of, of hydrogen and other uh, synthetic, and synthetic fuels. So it, it should be uh, starting now. I mean, this corresponds to an inflection. Uh, the, 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 the red curve is the same that we had before. Uh, the blue curve is with a higher rate of growth. So uh, where do we, how are we able to provide efficiency enough for this to happen? This is a context for information for someone who may be interested in that particular research question that I formulated in the beginning. My second research question is, what will be the optimum share of distributed small-scale generation in overall energy supply? And why did I remember this question? It's because you hear every day in the media that um, you know, renewables in buildings and, and, and uh, in commercial buildings and residential buildings and the industry and so on, this is, this is going to be the solution we're on the correct path to you know, solving all our energy problems. So the question is, okay, if we are able to um, comply with a positive answer to my first research question, then um, okay, we're seeing a, a rapid uh, growth of distributed uh, small scale generation, uh, electricity generation. Uh, but the question is, um, from the societal point of view, if not, well, I'm not talking about a realistic or non-realistic view, but exclusively, well, supposing that everything is possible from the technical point of view, what would be socially uh, acceptable as an optimum between, you know, a share between utility scale, uh, large scale, and small scale? Well, um, you know that urban, I mean, urban population is raised consistently. This is a... Uh, this is a, a United Nations uh, information, and it says that um, up to 2050, what is expected to happen is that rural population will decrease and urban population will increase. And according to uh, what is a general trend, urban settings tend to be more concentrated. 
not well, sometimes not for the good reasons, but the good reason for concentrated urban settings is that um, sustainability requires that people do not have to move too much money, mean, either for, for commuting or for acquiring goods. People should be able to not go too far for their needs or for their jobs. And this means a higher concentration of urban settings. Higher concentration, higher concentration of urban settings is at odds with a low, very low energy density of primary energy, a renewable primary energy. Wind is low density, solar radiation is very low density, so um, we need a, a large area to collect a small amount of power, and that is at odds with a small area for many people, right? So, what happens? Well, this is just an illustration there. You have a story building. Those um, panels are not able to supply all the needs of those, all, all the people living so even if you consider condominiums I and mean, solar condominiums, they should be outside town in large areas in order to be able to supply um, considerable amounts of power. So what happens is, uh, what is happening right now is this. I mean, this is in Mexico, uh, a PV, uh, a photovoltaic uh, station. It's a utility base and it's large scale, as you can see. Or a uh, concentrated solar power um, in, in China. Uh, as you can see, that the area used by this is huge. No, no, no distributed uh, solar uh, power here. This is concentrated. This is activity based. This is a large scale investment. So there is um, a, an international consultant based in, in, in the Netherlands, Gavi, which uh, makes some predictions and says, well, in 2050, the share of uh, utility scale. Um, Photovoltaics will be this one, and the residential will be this tiny little size, and so on. But the question is, this is not um, this is not a result. This is a forecast. This is not a result of an optimization um, procedure. I mean, this is not the result of someone putting himself or herself the problem. What should be the correct, optimum from the societal point of view, share of small scale. Uh, uh, versus large scale investment in, in, in district generation, uh, in, in renewable generation, sorry. So the question is, the, the, the second research question is about the optimum, right? How, how should we share this? Because you have lots of different variables. For instance, the levelized cost of energy of um, distributed um, generation in residential or commercial uh, settings is usually higher than the, the, the levelized cost of energy for, for the utility scale. Um, Utilities can investments. So the question is, where is the optimum? Who is satisfied with which? With which uh, situation? And how can we evaluate this from the societal point of view? Well, the third uh, research question is, you know, um, probably if you were, you know, generally attentive to what is being published, that there is uh, there are certain there is a certain number of uh, initiatives towards the development small scale fusion. Uh, nuclear fusion. Uh, the, the best well known is, is uh, MIT with the, the startup, which is financed by ENI, the uh, Italian utility, um, towards a, it's a spark project towards a small scale uh, nuclear fusion reactor. So if this succeeds, the question is um, what influence will, will it have? Because if, if this is successful, I'm, I'm not talking about the ITER project. It's a huge project just to, to demonstrate the feasibility of nuclear fusion. Right? It has an enormous investment. I cannot even imagine the, the, the quantity. It's a, an enormous figure of investment involved in ITER. This, this is small scale, much more modest from that point of view. But if this is successful, what happens is that all um, thermal based power stations, I mean, coal, -based, coal burning or natural gas burning or whatever, will be, I mean, the, the, the concept will remain. I mean, you, you just have to replace the boiler with a nuclear fusion reactor. And everything works the same. So, um, um, not distributed, utility scale, large scale uh, power stations will eventually be the solution to, of the future if nuclear fusion is to be mastered, right? So if, if this succeeds, we will see, again, reason for having concentrated Power stations delivering, uh, producing the power that is needed and delivering through transmission and distribution networks. 
And so we go back again to a little different perspective from, from what we have now. So the question is, this is a more or less a speculative research question. Uh, is this going to influence the use of intermediate sources, I mean the sun and, and, and the wind? Because this is going to be, you know, mm. completely um, endless. Mm. There is no end to the primary uh, ingredients that you have to use to produce electricity with fusion. So, okay, the question is, uh, how will the patents managed? Will, be, will they be open? I still doubt, but anyway, uh, will they, will be open? everyone will be able to manufacture these things, or the who masters the technology is going to dominate the market, and, and things will not be so clear as we imagine, and the probability of these solutions as well. The fourth research question is um, the consequence of this question raised. Well, came to my mind because I usually tell students that uh, energy efficiency is a, a, a tremendously powerful uh, weapon to gain us time for the nuclear fusion to be successful. So we have to not only, of course, for sustainability, to limit uh, greenhouse gas emissions and maintain the planet livable for us, uh, but actually also because we have to we have to have find ways of. Uh, some solution for the electricity supply in the future to come up, right? And, and so energy efficiency is one of the, the possible ways of looking at energy efficiency is uh, um, a, a, a means of gaining time. We're, get, we're just buying time in order to, for the solution to, to, to come up. So if, if we have energy abundance, I mean, if, since buying time along our buys, what will be the role of energy efficiency then? So this is speculative, but it's a, for those who may be interested, it's a, a, a research question. You know, eventually many of you don't even have ever heard about multiplying, but I'm not a big fan. So I decided that in order to come into a slightly different perspective, I use John Keats. Okay. Now, uh, a bit of context for the next uh, um, research questions, which will come up very quickly. Um, you, you know the Green Deal, right? It's the, the, the newest, um, the newest um, strategic, strategic uh, document of the European Commission. Even those of you who are not European uh, Union citizens eventually are aware of this. We have all good, lots of you know good uh, prospects and, and ambitions and so on. But if you look at the formulations, I I I, I usually don't put text in. in Slides, but I, I decided to put here because the formulations are important. I mean, if you look at the formulations, and I chose the, the ones which, which have some meaning for what I want to, to give the context to. Um, and, and the formulation has um, common rules for internal marketing and electricity, it's market. Uh, advantages of an integrated market, transparent energy prices and costs for consumers and sustainable low carbon energy systems. Um, they say, well, what do you, what do you mean? It's a smooth transition towards a sustainable low carbon energy system. And then the, the final uh, bullet says, uh, well, it, it um, aims at the competitive electricity market, and we're talking about electricity right now, um, which delivers real choice for, for customers, for energy consumers, for electricity consumers. Uh, so this means that um, freedom of choice is something that the, the European Commission deems to be one of the ambitions of the European citizens, right? Freedom of choice. And uh, the other thing is um, new business opportunities. It's very important ingredient. Competitive prices is another important ingredient. Efficient investment signals. It's not energy efficiency we're talking about. It's economic efficiency, right? Efficiency investment signals. Um, and contribute to security supply and sustainability. So the question is, you don't see sustainability as the main objective of the formulation of, of the Green Deal. You, you, the main objectives are competitive electricity markets, real choice, new business opportunities, competitive prices, and so on. And they will eventually contribute to sustainability, right? So it's a little bit uh, the reverse order 
that we would expect from a formulation uh, aiming at sustainability in general. But this is my personal concern. Um, well, this is so in spite of. Uh, well, I, I would like to tell you something a, a little bit, uh, something additional about this. We've been told this um, consistently over the years, and this creates a framework, a mental framework. I mean, we're all in European citizens and European, and European Union citizens. European, Europe is a different thing. The European Union citizens are very much um, used to everyday um, listening to the, the advantages of, of uh, freedom of choice, the existence of markets, lots of retailers who to sell their electricity and you may choose one of them and so on. So um, there is a psychological well, there's a psychologist who works at country of the day with AC I mean the Dominican Council for Energy Efficient Economy, who wants to identify the syndrome, which which is I can't remember the name, it has some, some kind of scientist name, which is um, people tend to ignore other realities when they are so deep um, when they um, um, plunge so deeply in, into a particular reality they cannot see outside. They can outside go outside the reality, look at the reality from the outside and see whether there are different things to be taken care of. Um, and so we've been told this for seven years. Uh, in spite of uh, existing all over the world, many market searches uh, with different property um, uh, natures, with different levels of integration of the value chain, and the value chain of electricity, as you, as you know, generation, transmission, distribution, supply means selling, right? Retailers and consumer, and consumers, of course. So the value, these are the phases of the, of the value chain. Uh, there are different levels of value chain integration. I mean, there are distributors who also supply, I mean, they sell energy. There are distributors who just run the network. Um, and there are uh, companies which have all the phases into it. Generation, transmission, distribution, and supply, and they sell energy. Uh, the degree of liberalization is very different from uh, region to region, from country to country. And of course, the nature of the, of the regulatory authority who runs these things uh, is also different from place to place. So, this is not what we have all over the world. This is one particular view of what may be possible. Um, if you look at the United States, for instance, which people generally, I mean, diffusely consider as the homeland of uh, freedom of choice and liberalization and so on, this is according to the Environmental Protection, Protection Agency of the States. The states, painted in blue, where you have liberalized markets. Okay, the others don't. Um, and even when you look at this, for instance, in California, I'll give you some examples. In California, Talking about liberalized market is not is not giving you the whole picture. I mean, because in California there exist dozens of different utilities which are virtually integrated uh, for your eventually surprise. This is a, a view of the ACT, I mean the American Council for Energy Efficiency in the Economy, um, which has an energy efficiency scorecard. They may classify the states in the United States according to their performance in energy systems. In, in energy efficiency, which is one particular ingredient of sustainability, right? Uh, if, you, if you compare the two maps, right, you see that the, the dark blues, for instance, uh, sorry, the, the dark blues, um, look at number four, for instance, up here. I don't know whether I can have, um, no, I don't. Yes, I do. Well, four, this is the one. I mean, this is one of the top states, and this is not the realized. This is, I suppose, uh, Wisconsin? I don't know exactly. Um, it's another one. This is Washington, right? the Washington state. So if you look at those, you see that these are not liberalized markets. They're virtually integrated utilities and they are champions, efficiency champions. Um, even, um, well, th this is interesting. Um, if you look at the energy efficiency programs, th this is a historical view um, from ACGP. Starting in 93. 93 was the year where um, liberalization entered into, in, into force in a significant uh, extent in the United States and it ceased, well, it made all, uh, well, basically all energy utilities to cease their energy efficiency efforts or programs that they had driven from the 80s until 93. And 93 was, was actually the peak of investment, which was not by date. 
billion, American billion, uh, thousands of millions, thousands of million dollars in 93. Actually, um, for all demand side management programs, these are quite Chinese numbers, uh, are much higher than that. So this is just energy efficiency. This is demand side management, which is, as probably some of you know, is more than energy efficiency. Um, and, uh, well, demand side management up to 93 caused uh, this enormously big amount of energy saved and this enormously big reduction of, of peak demand in the, in the United States. And all this up to 93 was based on vertically integrated activities, not realized real markets. Right? So what happened is that what happened subsequently was that utilities ceased to invest in energy efficiency and then someone came with the idea of introducing in the tariffs uh, non what we call in regulation non white possible levy, which is a public uh, a, a public uh, interest uh, rate. Every every consumer has to pay a fixed amount every month to finance energy efficiency programs. So suddenly there was money again in order to finance energy efficiency programs, even in a liberalized market even against the interests of some suppliers. Okay, but this, this is working. And this is working quite well, as you can see, right? Um, anyway, up to 93, there was a tremendous effort. You can see that the peak of production was quite, quite important. And we should bear in mind that uh, in a vertically integrated setting, what a, a company decides to do at the consumption side, and this happens in thousands of cases. I mean, if, if you have a particularly difficult situation supplying energy to a particular region and you want to balance what should be done, I mean invest in new capacity for supply or invest in an efficiency program in order to avoid investing in new supply capacity, then um, if you are vertically integrated, you act at the consumption side and you see the consequences at the generation side. I mean, you eventually postpone the investment in a new uh, power station or eventually just throw it out. It wasn't in mind before, and it, it is no longer because you, you were able to, with investment in energy efficiency at the consumption side, to avoid building a new power station. Mm -hmm. uh, if you break the, the if you break the chain, I mean, if if you uh, put generation independent from transmission, transmission independent from distribution, and distribution independent from supply, no one knows about anyone, right? So uh, if if someone uh, improves energy efficiency here. Um, well, generating companies don't give them just to speak very rapidly, right? They just don't care. Mm -hmm. uh, or eventually give you because they will you know, sell less energy, but that's very remote. Uh, if you look at the California Energy Efficiency Action Plan, it says that during 2018, public utility, publicly owned utilities, I mean utilities which are state or municipally owned, spent more than 280 million dollars on energy efficiency programs, resulting in more than 630 gigawatt hours in energy energy savings. And these publicly owned utilities are vertically integrated utilities. They are subject to a, a methodology of, and of, of annual planning, which is called integrated resource planning, mm -hmm. in which they are mandated to consider both uh, investment in energy efficiency uh, as equally as uh, investment in new, in new capacity investments. And so they have to plan this, the regulators approve their plans, and these yeah, IRP plans, they, they, they include energy efficiency programs. And here, for your surprise, actually, there are just two examples of enormous and enormous number of uh, California utilities who are vertically integrated and promote energy efficiency um, quite effectively, I should say. So the question, the question this context gives us is that Liberalized market is not the only option, right? And liberalized market is about freedom of choice, is about business opportunities, is about uh, investments, uh, efficient investments, and eventually to consider and uh, to to con con convey sustainability, to converge to sustainability, right? IRP is sustainability in itself. It's in intrinsically sustainable. Uh, another example is, is the, the, the province of British Columbia in, in, in Canada. The province of British, of British Columbia has one single utility, which is the uh, DC Hydro, 
And I, I just put here a, a small extract of the Clean Energy Act, which is a, a legal uh, document which rules uh, the British Columbia State uh, province. And as you can see, they're very much on the side of promoting sustainability. This is a mandate for the BC Hydro, which is their utility, which they say proudly it's a crown corporation owned by the government and people of British Columbia. So, um, and they say, well, this is one of their, um, one of their flags. I mean, the first and best way to meet our future electricity needs is through conservation and education. And they, well, they go on. Right? So, this is just a demonstration that there are many options for uh, sustainability paths, right? You can reach sustainability through market approaches, but you can reach sustainability eventually in a less complicated way uh, with uh, non-legalized markets. So, the question is, my fifth question after this context is um, if you look at both options, what is more efficient for the part of your society? And this is uh, eventually a source for qualitative as well as quantitative mm -hmm. research. Uh, the sixth question is is a revised market a facilitator of efficiency? Uh, if, well, it's another very interesting question. Because you have, if you go through this research question, you have to go through uh, regulatory um, buildings in several different parts of the world and see what, what are the most complex regulatory buildings, the regulatory schemes. And the most complex regulatory schemes will tell you which is uh, the, the easiest, will tell you which is the easiest situation to foster energy efficiency. Uh, more complicated or less complicated, it depends. So, the seventh research question is Is the liberalized market facilitator flexibility management? I mean, managing altogether renewable energy, uh, uh, storage, energy storage, uh, demand, I mean, demand side management in general, demand response in particular. Uh, is the liberalized market facilitator? It's, if you look at this research question, you will have to identify all the agents involved in implementation of flexibility management. Mm. And what are the relations between all those agents? Are there many or are there few? If there are many, the relations are more complex. If there are few, the relations are, more, are simpler. And eventually, the results are simpler to obtain. But it depends on the research you make on this, right? But it's a legitimate question. Uh, so it's not because there is a market. It's not necessarily because there is a liberalized market that flexibility is um, easier to attain. I mean, flexibility is there. It was there since the 80s up to 93 when vertically integrated utilities in the United States practiced demand side value. They managed flexibility. Um, is the liberalized market a facility of power systems control? I mean, managing the power system. Um, again, if you look at the complexity of the, of the organization of the market with market operators, independent system operators, um, and all sorts of agents, um, in one situation or the other, you will eventually reach a conclusion. Right? And this is another, eventually, qualitative research you may do. Uh, is it a requirement for real-time pricing? Um, I remind you that uh, in the 80s, there was a, a, an experiment, I told some of you already, some of you have already heard me telling this story, I'm not going to repeat it, but there was a, an experience in, in, in the United Kingdom where um, the vertical integrated utility in combination with the, with the British Broadcasting Corporation um, put up a, a, an experiment where smart meters at the time received the price signal of electricity every five minutes and the, the smart meters at, at, at the demand locations reacted according to the parameters that the consumers inserted in their smart meters. Uh, to avoid consumption during high, peak price, high, high prices uh, and, and allow consumption in certain or certain circuits during low prices. And, and this is all automatic with real time pricing, five minutes. Uh, frequency is 12 times an hour, right? Um, so, uh, liberalized market is required for real time pricing. It's, it's a nice question. You have to imagine what, well, if you want to go through this research question, you have to research with. What are the realities in, in many different parts of the world? Is there any real-time price experiment that was ever? So you, you go through those and you extract the conclusions and you eventually are able to reverse this research question. 
Uh, is it transparent and available to citizens, the labor market? Uh, again, the research question requires that you compare different situations. For instance, those electrical utilities in California which are vertically integrated, what are their tariff schemes? Uh, how are prices set? How are they controlled by the, the, the regulator? And how are um, consumers informed about the tariff schemes and, and the prices they have to bear? And then you compare that with um, a different situation where the liberalized market exists and prices are set in, by suppliers, uh, each supplier in its own way, uh, in, in a private manner, in a private relation with each consumer, right? So you, you have to compare that and, and conclude according to this research question, which is more transparent and clear to the consumers. Um, my 11th, it's the four last research question is, how do we find societal interest? I mean, I, I mean, I've, I, I've been talking about societal interest and the public point of view from, from this public interest point of view, sorry. Um, what is the best, the best balance approach to define societal interest? And this is the foreground for all research questions that you've seen from the third onwards, right? Or the fourth onwards. Um, because if you want to if you want to look at research, at research questions from the societal point of view, you have to be able to define what is societal interest. And societal interest depends very much on the perspective. And what is the balance? And the perspective is, well, do you, do you privilege economic efficiency? I mean, what way is the most uh, efficient from the point of view of economics? Um, and from that point of view, which is a stakeholder that you look at if you look at this from the efficiency from the economic efficiency point of view. If you look at the consumer, or at the generator, or at the supplier, or it depends, right? Um, multiple costs and multiple benefits. Energy efficiency is um, generating multiple benefits. Health benefits, job benefits, you can name it. There are dozens of benefits from energy efficiency. Um, according to, well, not to speak about the environmental ones. So, um, what is, how can you define societal interest based on this particular view. Um, IRP, I mean integrated resource planning, or energy efficiency first, as now is the buzzword for IRP. Um, is it through cost hedging or uh, price transparency? What, what is more important for uh, the societal interest? What volume of transaction costs? I mean, if you imagine a legalized market situation where there are many different actors, um, they have to, you know, interact with each other uh, with enormous, an enormous volume of transactions, and this has a cost associated to it. So, but the advantages may be, may be higher than the transaction costs. So the side of interest may, may be, well, if you look at the economic efficiency point of view, transaction costs may be lower than the advantages, or the reverse. And then there is the, the, the question may be answered differently de depending on the conclusions you take. Um, what really useful jobs um, depend on, on each one of uh, the, 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 the diverse options from the societal interest point of view, which are the bad variables. I mean, the energy bill that uh, a consumer has to pay has to, um, has to um, be able to um, guarantee supplier revenues, generate, suppliers is the retailer, the one who sells the energy to the consumer. The generator revenues, the independent system operator or the transmission network uh, revenues, the distribution system operator revenues, the regulator revenues, the aggregator if there exists uh, revenue. So everyone here has to have a share of what the uh, energy consumer pays each month. And so this, the money that this person pays has to comply with the, the financial needs of all these agents, right? So it depends on, on how you define self interest. Right? And, and this is a, a very broad research question. So, in the end, we have to ask ourselves, this is purely speculative, eventually qualitative research based, because you may issue some inquiries to a sample of inquiries, right? And then you will treat the data and see what, what comes out. But the question is, which one is, uh, are they, are, they, are markets organizations, are, Professor, um, one of the persons who, who had the, sorry, who had the 
um, generosity of uh, making some comments on myself, um, who was uh, formerly the president of the National Federation. I heard him once say in one in one uh, PhD. Uh, it was a PhD physics project, uh, defense. He said, I remember very well, he said, market, the market is a human creation. Right? So if the market is a human creation, eventually the, the answer to this question uh, is present. Right? Because if it is a human creation, it, it is ideologically, um, ideologically influenced. Right? So the question, my, my last question is this one. And it, it's more for me to reflect upon the fact that we should look at every problem uh, from as distant a point of view as possible in order to, get, to, to grasp all the characteristics of the problem. If you live in, inside a, a, a legalized market in a setting, you should be able to look at that from an out perspective and look at it and, and Organize your research and ask your research questions independently of living inside that reality or outside that reality. You should always look for myself, right? And since I'm a big fan of um, one about the cartoons, I finish like this. <laughs> Where the, the labor, which is not, it's very far from the Communist Party uh, 
as you know, right? It's, it's a social democratic party, more or less. It, it has its ups and downs, but in general, it, it is like that. <clears throat> in one particular, well, the documentary I recommend, if you, if you have the opportunity to, to look to see the spirit of 45, it's a very interesting one. Um, one particular detail that caught my attention was about the, 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 the railway transportation. Uh, the railway transportation has a big tradition in, in England, and it was run up to, up to 45 in a setting where there were multiple private companies uh, in the railway. They even earned not only trains, but in, uh, tracks. I mean, they earned tracks. And so what, what the results of this, which came from the late 19th century, it, it went all through the, the, the 20th century up to, to 1948 or something like that. Um, a passenger woman who had to move from point A to point B, we eventually have to go through tracks from which were owned by different companies, right? So we have to pay a certain amount, which will, which would be uh, whose whose value should be able to pay uh, the uh, corresponding revenues of the different companies of the tracks that he went through, right? So this demanded that uh, because of the initiative that occurred at the beginning of the, the 13th century. This demanded uh, I mean, the existence of a structure which is very well known from the communist general, which is the, um, the railway clearing house. It, it's a very well known institution. The railway clearing house was, a, was a, 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 a huge building where 400 people worked. 400 people. Uh, and they were just managing the transactions between companies because of each and single uh, trip that a particular good that was transported by train or a particular passenger caused to, uh, to the railway revenues accounting because of you know, going from A to B. So this uh, railway um, clearinghouse, which, was, which is actually, uh, it is part of, it is one of the pieces of, of the important museum in, in, in England. It is deemed to be a, a very smart and intelligent creation of solving um, a balance between different agents on the market. Right? What did the labor government do? I mean, uh, they didn't use the buzzwords a long time, but if, with the buzzwords a long time, we would say that they thought that those people here were not adding any value to the service provided by the railway. Right? They were not really doing it. The passenger didn't care whether. Um, company A or Company B received two cents or two pennies or three pennies or whatever. It, it, they just wanted to go from A to B, right? And then pay the, 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 the fee that corresponded to that. So the labor, the, the, the labor government decided that this is completely useless. I mean, if we run the railway as a single railway, uh, with no transactions between different agents, with no transaction costs associated, all these 400 useless jobs would cease and persons will have a very clear and transparent uh, tariff system for the railway, and everything will be simple. And so they nationalized all the railway companies. Uh, the British railways were, were created then, um, and, and the 400 people were employed in different other, uh, they didn't lose their jobs, so they were employed in different other places. Well, this is a very good outcome. Exactly, it's very really integrated because the same company ruled the tracks and, and the logistics and, and the compositions and the trains and, and, the, and the commercial activity, everything was in the same company, right? So it was a vertically integrated utility which provided the service of railroad transportation. And this is not company, so this is labor party, it's a labor company. So all the solutions are possible. Uh, um, uh, I mean, different um, democratic implementations different uh, sets of rules for uh, common living among people may be possible with uh, more or less efficient solutions according to what people choose, right? In that particular case, I mean, the, the United Kingdom people decided to send home Winston Churchill and, and let out the labor government, and this is what happened. Uh, of course, in late 80s, Margaret Thatcher again privatized the Railways, and then there were pretty big, pretty bad accidents that occurred later on. Uh, anyway, and even 
The reason I had to take care of the rails, railways, because there was a mess with the timetables and uh, you know all that. But anyway, to answer your question, uh, the, of course this is ideological from my point of view, right? The options are always ideological. Uh, what, what the research question could lead to is to uh, which are the ideologies behind each option, right? Uh, what are the usual uh, choices of people according to tradition, history, sociological settings, and so on? That, that's a very interesting point of view. That is why the research question, from my point of view, makes some sense. But the, the question is not narrow uh, as your, I mean, the, the answer is not narrow as your question eventually suggested, right? Yeah, and conclusively, conclusively um, you told us something about uh, part dependency, if I recall, in, in, in energy economics and something like that. In achieving the goal in 2050 years time, will this therefore become one of the factors to consider as like uh, an element of part dependency towards the different growth in different society? Because when we were comparing what um, um, you see in China today about decarbonization and, and their energy scale. And then we looked at the US and looked at Japan and the path dependency um, because of the natural resources of the, of the specific society, the laws and how they, they evolve into that, meeting their energy needs. So what I'm saying is that if uh, a research question like, like you have put forward is answered, would it be important to consider it as one of the influences of um, the path dependency theories or ideology, if, if you understand me? Uh, I think definitely, yes. Uh, okay, okay. You know, uh, history. The past is, is essential. And essential ingredients are in the future. So I think that, you know, um, the world, I mean, Europe and whatever other continents in the world has to be seen, from my point of view, as an enormously beautiful diversity of cultures and history and, and you know traditions and so on. All those things influence the way we behave, uh, our choices and so on. So I think that the solutions will be very different from from region to region and country to country. And that's service. Right. Thank you. Okay, before ending your session, uh, I will call uh, Professor Carl Zengler, as he likes to call people, our well beloved <laughs> coordinator. <laughs> no, 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 he's the well beloved coordinator and the, uh, no, and the event. And, uh, just, just, just a correction. Uh, today's session was organized by the uh, research and the uh, license to, to companies uh, committee. So, Carlos, please come. <laughs> Eu 
gostaria de sintetizar o que já toda a gente falou de, dos imensos uh, méritos do António Martins. Eu acho que sintetizaria da seguinte forma. É aquele irmão mais velho que a gente pensa, epá, como crescer, eu gostava de ser assim. Uh, o Manuel Gamay pediu-me para comprar uma torradeira uh, em uma iniciativa de gerar sustentabilidade, mas as torradeiras já são esgotadas. E então, como sei que o António Martins, e depois também tive a começar a informação no lado de casa, é um grande apreciador de jazz clássico, uh, nós, uh, iniciativa de gerar sustentabilidade, uh, comprámos o The Gold Collection do Mike Savings, que espero que tenhas muito tempo para apreciar. Ok? Index 
is based on the concept of the circular economy, which is associated with the three R principles, the reduce, reuse, and recycle, which later was expanded to the six R's, the reuse, recycle, redesign, remanufacture, reduce, recover, and recover. The main objective of the circular economy is to reduce the environmental impact, uh, proposing the, the economic growth through uh, business development. And we focus this uh, concept because we think it's very important nowadays. Well, uh, we focus also on the uh, tourism sector because we know that hotels are um, uh, energy uh, extensive uh, facilities in the, the service sector uh, with corresponding high uh, energy costs. So we focus in this, uh, in this sector and also because we know that hotels uh, have two hour operational life cycles which leads to consume also a significant amount of resources, generate also large carbon footprint and produce excessive quantities of waste. To compute our uh, index, uh, we, we base it on the eight dimensions of the Circular Economy Action Plan in 2050. Uh, uh, from these eight dimensions, one of them will we not use it because it's uh, the industrial symbiosis that is directly associated with the manufacturing sector, manufacturing industry. So uh, we work only with the seven dimensions. Uh, associated to each of the, these dimensions, we have chosen also a set of indicators based on the literature review. Uh, these indicators reflect also uh, circularity practices that are implemented by hotels around the world and uh, that we find in the literature review. Well, uh, to uh, compute our index, we use a, a survey and uh, we design also a dictionary that we send to the main responsibles for the hotels uh, and uh, we try to give them to, to, to bring collect their, their perception about the level of importance of the seven blocks uh, that I presented previous uh, and also the uh, corresponding indicators associated with uh, uh, to the one of, of, of that. Also, uh, uh, we want to know their perception about the level of implementation of the circularity practices uh, in the, their hotels. Well, this leads to a set of questions and also a set of dimensions and uh, we choose to use the data and analysis, the DA, uh, trying to uh, compute our index. Well, why do we have used the, the DA? Because uh, we know that it allows to compute an aggregate in that index, that is our objective. Uh, based on endogenous choice of weights and also because uh, it makes possible to choose the weights that maximize the data index uh, of, uh, to each of organization, uh, providing like this uh, a fair measure of circularity. I will, I would like to say that we are working on this, uh, this research uh, at this moment, we have collected data from uh, Spain and Portugal, uh, from the hotels, and at this moment we are trying to uh, work on the construction of the index that we like to propose in order also to give some information to the hotels about their behavior in terms of circularity and also to make possible do a benchmarking analysis uh, to the, the sector. Okay, thank you for your attention. I have only five minutes. I have this information, so it was uh, to start my presentation. Thank you for your attention.
which is not uh, uh, which is not uh, unexpected because the transportation sector is the largest uh, comes uh, as the largest consumption share, but also uh, in the residential sector, which is uh, uh, anyway a sector which in the Azores is as a, a per capita consumption, uh, which is not uh, high. And so this is a significant uh, impact in terms of the changes that are foreseen with the plan. Um, in terms of the changes in the fuel consumption, uh, the, in the, the different sources of energy, it may seem strange that the most is in terms of diesel. It is in part a response to the transportation, but there is a, a not seen an unseen change here in the in the fuel consumption due to the uh, first the change the electrification effort, which will switch a significant part of it of uh, consumption from uh, fuel to. Uh, the new renewable sources, and also by the change in terms of the industrial uh, sector. And finally, to end uh, my five minutes, just to make the acknowledgement and the, the, the thanks to the, the INESH team, which uh, is an extended team, including an invited uh, participation by Professor Varanda from Hawaii. Uh, also reflects the spirit of AFS, the interdisciplinarity and cooperation between the R and D units here in the AFS community. Thank you very much. was foreseen an expansion of the it was, it was foreseen the, the use for industrial the industrial use of, of uh, geothermal energy which was isn't, doesn't exist yet there were some efforts to, to include it but there are there is no practical application yet and it's an opportunity because there are significant sources in the island and so it's a it's a an option that is considered in the plan and uh, that is foreseen to extend. I mean, for electricity production, production, well, we use the vehicles. That already exists. They have the, the, they have a significant uh, uh, share of, of uh, electricity production from the, the geothermal sources, but that those were not the, the aim of our uh, energy efficient action plan. Our plan is for the end use, is not for, for the, the power generation sector. Yes. 
Hello, uh, John Gert. Um, I would like to uh, ask you a question about uh, the specificity of Azores, in particular regarding transportation. Uh, can you detail um, what, what's the share of the problem and how can you improve um, or reduce, in this case, um, energy related problems regarding transportation in an archipelago? Because if you have uh, aviation between the islands, uh, road transport, and then you have, let's say, road transport within each island, right? So what's the share of each of these uh, different components? The, the, the largest share of consumption by, by the significant differences is the road transportation, uh, uh, which is perhaps odd, but it's true. Road transportation and essentially by uh, small vehicles. Very small use of public transportation in the source and public uh, vehicles, uh, automobiles, uh, the autos are, are used for, cars are used for everything, even for transporting the transportation of water to the pastures, to the, to the milk uh, stations, to the, to the cows, which are the biggest number of uh, animals in the source. Uh, so the the, 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 the transportation sector, road transportation sector is by large the, the dominant uh, share of consumption. That, that's why the that change, which is not uh, the, the measures that we devise, are not unrealistic. They are they were in partly uh, dictated by the, the, the desires and the, the plans of the region, but they are not unrealistic. And even without unrealistic changes, the energy savings that are uh, uh, attainable are very significant uh, with things like uh, uh, the, the renewable of, of uh, vehicles, the, the, the replacement of, of vehicles with, uh, with the electric vehicles, but also with things like uh, water supply to the pastures and so a lot of several measures, several actions that we devised in order to reduce the usage of the road transportation, of the current road transportation needs. Have you considered only the replacement of the vehicles in the street or, for instance, some big consideration of the public transportation or car sharing. Yes, like well, well, those are plans. The actions include the actions include also share, the car sharing modes, <coughs> car sharing systems, the, the soft modes of transportation, and public transportation. Considered as individual groups or society. 
even organizations. And people, as we have seen today, is, it, is at the core of the energy system. But, and now I need to discuss with Professor Martins because today he said, basically, if we don't have a verticalized electricity system, people will become more or less irrelevant. That's what I understood. But nevertheless, I want to say that social, this, this also means that social and technical dimensions in energy context should always be joined, never be separated. Well, let me go back. I was still in the, in the kindergarten when a young researcher called Antoine Bouchard Martins published a first paper on load management. And he discussed the role of end users on load management to reduce electricity bills, to smooth load profiles. He discussed flexibility and storage. I was still in kindergarten right then. This work proceeded, and later on, a team joined, a team that gathered researchers from research, from Inesh from the MIT, from the Institute of Psychology here in Quimbra, from the Institute of Social Sciences here in Quimbra, and this team joined in a project called Energy Box to develop a system, a tool, a technology that aimed to monitor, control, and coordinate and electricity use, storage, and selling in a residential setting. I entered this project study users' preferences, patterns of electricity use, and study this problem from the behavior, from the person, from the people perspective. Then the team worked on other projects and also developed a multi-criteria decision approach in which preferences, interests, perspectives from different stakeholders in the energy efficiency world were elicited or studied to better assess energy efficiency initiatives. But energy and behavior were, have been also, have been always been included in Inesh Kimbra consulting activities, as we have just shown. I don't know if you saw. But in the energy efficiency uh, plan for the Azorian government, we also included behavioral dimensions there. The, the behavioral dimensions have also been included in all energy efficiency handbooks that we have developed, in the design of policies and energy efficiency initiatives, and in the design of behavioral change interventions all over this period, which has been long. Moreover, in 2016, we organized one of the most important conferences on energy and behavior here in Quimbra. It was Behave, very interesting conference, bringing people from around the world. I miss these times. Previous COVID, I, I truly miss these times. And once again, energy and behavior are being called into what? Special issues in energy efficiency, in energies, and we are coming, we are calling researchers from all around the world to bring, sorry, to bring their different approaches and perspectives into, into these uh, publications. And last Christmas, we had a gift. Santa brought us this edited book that shows uh, multidisciplinary visions on energy behaviors from economics, engineering, psychology, sociology, and other uh, sciences that discuss also different sectoral perspectives, not only the residential sector, but also transports, community cities, uh, address different modeling approaches. Different modeling approaches are considering and including and incorporating energy behaviors, and finally, interventions and policies from around, around the world to promote behavioral change change are, were also discussed. Sorry. In conclusion, uh, we don't know the answer to this question, how to move to low carbon, uh, low carbon future. We, we actually don't know, don't know. What I think we can say from this, I don't know, some decades of work, for me it's only 10 years of work in this field, is 
is that we need to move from that, and we are engineering faculty. We need to move from the solution that we think, okay, this technology will solve the problem, because it won't. Or we need to stop thinking that people need to change their behavior, because they won't, unless we are obliged, as we are now, we must. Mm -hmm. We need to think the system, the energy system as a whole. We need to work in a team. And the team is wider than we are in this room. The team needs to include those that are outside in the real world, making real world experiments and trying to change the world. I was called an ideologist today, so I like to be, at least for now. Of course, we will use modeling as a tool because we are scientists, but we can use the society as a leverage. We can use citizen participation as a leverage to help us in this process. Thank you. Uh, insulation products, so we refer to them as super insulation products. 
public contests, there are uh, very strict limitations regarding the area use. Mm -hmm. So it is important to reduce the area of the walls and to, because they are such a thin solution, if we have a benefit in terms of the areas saved or the, the, the area gained in terms of, of, of rental properties, uh, if we take that into account and we have to, regarding the the common framework of the, I don't know the name of the regulation, <laughs> but the, the European regulation for the cost optimal methodology it does not take into account the rental, but we took that into account, and in, in those cases, if it is, it can be beneficial. Do you think it would be useful, for instance, in buildings with uh, some restrictions, for instance, if we are considering uh, historical buildings in the city centers where interventions are more difficult to... Uh, yes, because even in terms of the, uh, if we insulate from the inside, if the thickness uh, can be uh, less, we can uh, try to <laughs> to save the area and try to, um, to to not lose the specificity of the building from the inside. But uh, in terms of external applications, that's not so good for <laughs> historical buildings. But yes, it, it has the advantage of the, of the area, so uh, it can also... The, the demonstration case from the inside was um, a roof and the walls, but only the roof was monitored. But uh, but it was to also to to prove the application, so not just the monitoring, but the, that application was was done. So yeah, I think it's useful. Yeah, I think it is. Size of our study area where we apply the model. 
Um, so, measurements. Um, in Quibra uh, and our research projects that I present here today are focused mainly on the Quibra urban area. Uh, so, uh, in Quibra we have two air purchase stations. Uh, one uh, is Urban Ground Station, uh, where it's located in the Geophysical Institute, and the idea here is to be to measure the air pollution levels representative to the city, and uh, uh, the station is uh, not influenced by directly by any pollution source. And then we have another air pollution station uh, on the Avenue Fernand Monagaish, uh, where it's located close to the traffic. Uh, so uh, the uh, very simple graph that I present here is based on uh, many data. Uh, we use a six, a six year time series and to demonstrate here how is a typical pattern during the day on the background station and traffic station. And also we can see in terms of the uh, seasonal pattern. So what is happening during the year? Again, I will not the idea here is not to discuss the numbers, but you can understand that the colors, red colors are related with more uh, uh, pollution and you see here a um, clear difference between urban background the, uh, stations that is not affected directly by the uh, pollution source and we have a traffic air quality station. So this is the idea here is to use measurements to, ident to identify the problem. Uh, this is uh, um, data from the regular network, uh, uh, long-term long measurements. Also during the project, we uh, in, uh, installed um, air quality monitoring station at uh, University uh, Stadium and we make measurements during six months with a lot of data but it is not possible to represent, to represent everything today here. Um, so, um, now modeling. We use modeling uh, because uh, it is important to understand the problem. Uh, how uh, road traffic contribute for pollution levels. And uh, here we use the modeling cascade where we start from the transportation modeling. Um, where we have the regions and destinations of the different trips. Uh, then we use this data to analyze emissions. Uh, so we have a methodology to, to quantify emissions from the vehicles and uh, finally we can obtain uh, this air quality modeling uh, no, we don't have one mm -hmm. no. mm -hmm. okay, okay. so um, uh, we have, we have uh, uh, traffic uh, volume uh, from the transportation modeling we have emissions, uh, uh, distribution uh, of emissions in time and space in the city, and then finally we have a uh, special distribution of the uh, pollution uh, in the city uh, obtained from air quality modeling. Okay, you know the problem you can identify uh, the, uh, the contribution of transportation uh, to um, pollution levels, and uh, of course it is important to have some ideas what you can do to resolve the problems and uh, what uh, measures can be implemented. Uh, and I like very much this idea about improved, shift, avoid, and reduce. So we are talking about the improved technology, we, uh, we're talking here about different fleet, we're uh, talking here about the cleaner vehicles, uh, we can shift in terms of the transport modes, so that we use uh, not uh, private cars, but we use uh, public transport uh, or so modes. And we're talking about avoid or reduce in terms of the demand management. So uh, I think this is a very good example uh, now when we uh, live in uh, the COVID restrictions, uh, we have uh, teleworking that show us some potentials uh, that, uh, that we can implement to reduce our um, daily trips between residents and uh, working. Of course, uh, I'm not talking here about the expense situations, <laughs> but uh, we uh, have several results that were presented uh, during uh, last months. Uh, how uh, during the COVID-19, uh, 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 because of the number of the car users decreased, 
how it's decreased their pollution level in these cities. Um, so some uh, some uh, examples uh, that we uh, in the metric in the research project, and here we have one of the uh, examples is low emission zone. Low emission zones is a very popular measure now in many European cities and not only in the Euro. Um, in Portugal we have low emission zone in Lisbon. So the idea here is um, mainly that we have uh, the city centre that uh, with, with restrictions to come uh, more um, polluted vehicles, uh, old vehicles in the city centre as a measure uh, to reduce the pollution in the city centre. And we uh, use this idea to apply to Quibra. Of course, this is academic study, we don't have low emissions only in Quibra, but the idea here is that the this measure can contribute to resolve the problem. And actually, uh, I, I will not uh, go deeply uh, to the results, but actually the, uh, the results show us that it depends how we analyze the outputs, how we analyze the results. Because if you look only on the city center and low emission zone, where we potentially restrict uh, the um, old vehicles to drive in the city center, we can reduce the number of passenger cars, we can reduce uh, the emissions, and we can uh, reduce the concentration. But this measure could affect uh, in terms of the entire city because we have longer trips to go from our original destination, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, if we look on the results uh, global, globally on the city scale, not on the city we can find that we have an increase in the number of kilometers direct, an increase in the emissions and also in concentration. Uh, and uh, so I will jump to speak because uh, the last point here is uh, if we analyze only uh, close to the airport chain monitoring station, it could not be representative for the entire area. Um, this is one of the examples that I would like to present and another example uh, of uh, the application of our methodology uh, is related to this air quality forecast. Um, you uh, know what is the desert forecast, we use it every day, uh, but air, air quality forecast is the next step. So it, uh, to, uh, to be able uh, to uh, apply models for air quality forecast, we need meteorological forecast, emission sources, uh, and we need uh, the uh, long-range transfer of the pollution uh, because if we have some problems in the city, this doesn't mean that only urban sources are contributed to this. So we need uh, to have information about the transfer uh, of the pollution from other uh, regions. Uh, so we use here uh, the um, data from Copernicus European Service uh, that um, uh, give us information about uh, air quality forecast for Europe. Then we have uh, downscaling and finally uh, information for the city that will give us the response for air quality forecast at city scale. Uh, we developed a prototype uh, of this uh, system uh, and I mentioned here as a um, site that it's built. It doesn't work currently as an uh, operational forecast, but you can, uh, you can find the data if you're interested for, for February of this year that was applied using operational forecast data and outputs. Ah, and uh, finally, we try here to see, to represent the outputs of, from our models, not only in a quantitative way, but also in a qualitative way to be useful uh, for a non specialist in the air pollution. Because if I'm talking that I have 38 micrograms per uh, cubic meter of particulate matter, what conclusions can we derive from this? So we, we put here uh, the qualitative way to, from green to red color to be able to uh, translate this message uh, for, the, uh, uh, for, for the general public. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, this is results from several projects um, and was developed by, by a big team uh, uh, that is a contribution from different universities. And uh, I'm from the research center, so I would like to introduce this here. And thank you very much.
couldn't avoid noticing that when you showed the, the interseasonal uh, illusion patterns of the of the urban background and, and the traffic station, that in February mornings the urban background had higher pollution levels than the traffic station. Is, is there an explanation for that? Well, uh, the explanation is because, uh, as I mentioned, usually we have uh, the urban Thank you. Uh, to model the, uh, the okay, we use meteorological data. Uh, does it have enough resolution, for example, to capture the small uh, effects of, for example, buildings, uh, direction of the wind related to direction of streets and, and things like that? Yeah, we have, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, we have different models, and special resolution depends on the entire area. So if we're talking about, about uh, application that we have here, the resolution is about 10 meters to itself. And we have, uh, in, term, in terms of the, uh, the circulation, we consider the street canyons. So this is the effect of the buildings. It's a very simplified model uh, here. We cannot go to the detailed uh, models because at, uh, in this case, we cannot simulate the uh, entire city. So we can focus on the so this is, should be a compromise. Um, did you develop a kind of a risk assessment index costing, for example, the emissions with a population density? Uh, we have, we, uh, in, uh, in our project, uh, one of the components, right, I, I didn't mention it, uh, the two important components of the project because it's not possible to do uh, in this presentation have inputs on the buildings. We have a group that was particularly focused on the impact of air pollution on the uh, buildings, materials, uh, with the uh, experimental campaign. And uh, we also have the modeling of population exposure. Just a quick question about the graph on the left, because it also puzzled me a little. Graph on the left? Yes. Oh, the same side. Yeah, same side. Because uh, what is the explanation for such a high concentration on the, on the evening hours? I would expect uh, a, a higher uh, two, two explanations. Uh, because here it's important not only uh, the traffic emissions, but in case of M2, we're talking about chemical reactive pollutant. So this is uh, the uh, sun radiation because it's photochemical uh, pollution. So it's uh, about emissions, about uh, the uh, pollution levels accumulated during the night that start uh, the chemical cycle when the sun rises uh, and thermal uh, conditions for the mixing. So several reasons. Para dizer que eu primeiro não tinha percebido o enquadramento deste resource aí. Uh, mas, <risos> <risos> mas uh, não me posso sair do palco sem a que eu tive um privilégio de trabalhar com o professor Martins durante diferentes iniciativas que ele lançou e acho que isto é só para mim.
good afternoon. First of all, and also my congratulations to Professor Antonio Martins. It's a pleasure to, to also work with him in several initiatives. He's always doing a lot of initiatives, and it's a pleasure to, to be involved. So, um, I come from civil engineering and from the CITADIS uh, Research Center. Uh, but I'm going to talk uh, about an issue that is obviously quite multidisciplinary. And we heard about sustainable mobility more than once um, today. Uh, so, we know that our daily activities have changed drastically because of mobility and uh, because of the need to keep social distancing. So I'm going to talk about um, this issue in a more broad term, so about the way we need to push forward uh, this concept of sustainable mobility in the future, because we don't know when this is going to end, and we don't know when this is going to happen again. So, uh, we now have a lot of things happening at distance, but for the majority of us, there's still the need to move daily. And in the last years, all around the world, uh, researchers in this area have been working on concepts such as shared electric and autonomous vehicles, and also on active mobility, walk and cycle, especially for, the, in this case, for short distances. Um, of course, when we talk about shared, we are talking about sharing uh, vehicles in, in the interior of the vehicles, and we are also talking about sharing urban space. And with this issue of social distance, distance we really need to incorporate different aspects in our models. There is a, a huge threat in the present situation that we are still we are already observing which is the returning to the car. So we were developing this, this way, this path towards trying to minimize our use of the car. And now we are going back very quickly because most of the people that had the opportunity to use the car uh, are afraid of using the vehicle, uh, of using the public transport and go back to, to the car. But there are also a lot of opportunities here. And I will start precisely by active mobility, which is very good for social distance. It was uh, rather used during the lockdowns, and it's very good for health too, because it's a subject that also came up to the daily news, the importance of our health. And it is also, um, for short, short distances, is the most efficient way to, for us to move in terms of energy. It's our own energy. Uh, and it's our own health that is in, in, in game. So, uh, other opportunity uh, um, a concept we already know, which is uh, the mobility as a service and, and use of data, we need now to incorporate in our optimization models, we need to incorporate this social distance issue. And we can have information in our mobile phones about this new circumstance. So, there are huge opportunities for research around uh, um, mobility as a surf under these new circumstances. And we also need to move toward, towards these concepts such as inclusive mobility, so mobility for all and in all transport modes. Uh, the low carbon cities, we already spoke about it today. Um, and of course we need to become new, neutral, this is, this is the objective uh, by 2050. And also uh, into the concept or towards the concept of smart cities. Because mobility is a, is a city essential component and it integrates all transport modes and all citizens' needs. So it's the way we need to think about it. And finally, city planning. So city planning must involve um, under these new circumstances too. So we need new city landscapes and infrastructures for new mobility. So we need more green, we need more space, we know that, so we need to work uh, towards that. So some research projects that, that are being developed, uh, they are rather multidisciplinary too, because this is a multidisciplinary area. 
And for example, uh, these are some of those where I've been involved. Other colleagues of mine are involved in similar uh, projects uh, like this. And for example, where to locate uh, stations for uh, electric vehicles charging or uh, the implementations of bike sharing services or the importance of the access to public transport. So equity in terms of public transport or uh, design cities um, in a more uh, um, straightforward way to have uh, to accommodate our needs to walk uh, safely and to use also other transport modes safely. Um, why um, university students in Portugal uh, are using, uh, have such low levels of using, uh, for example, the bicycle? We need to study that because it's not what we, we see in other European countries. And also, uh, this is a new um, work, but it shows, again, as I was saying, it shows this multidisciplinary um, um, trend of, the, of sustainable mobility which is, for example, the hair quality inside buses. This is just just beginning. It is uh, with, uh, in cooperation with Professor Ronald Almeida. Uh, and, of course, this shows that there are huge and very ma many diverse opportunities for research within this area and very specially, uh, particularly and under these new con uh, conditions. Um, some projects, all financed by FCT, like um, uh, solutions for, for bicycling in hilly cities, why not? There are a lot of things to do and think about it. Um, also, this concept, integrated concept I was telling about earlier, about uh, the, the fully shared electric and automated mobility, both in urban and regional terms also. The, the need to incorporate and to give access to the older population, which is getting bigger and bigger, so we need to think about cities in this way to accommodate these new, new needs. Uh, and also, um, how can we use our digital footprints in order to analyze mobility and to plan better mobility? For example, in this case, it was in cooperation with colleagues from the informatic department. And finally, in cooperation with colleagues from mechanical engineering in, in Lisbon and also with colleagues from the uh, uh, sport faculty in Coimbra, this uh, soft mode modeling, modeling in human trips. I should say that we are not uh, calling it soft modes, but instead active modes, because they are related with uh, uh, with our directly with energy and with our health. Finally, future cities um, are cities that, that are low in carbon, that are smart, connected, green, inclusive, and healthy. And these are the words that we need to call inside our research. So, finally, I would like to invite you to um, a webinar that is going to happen. Uh, 18 of November. Um, it is going to be announced uh, officially very, very soon, and we are, you, we, you are all invited, uh, and it was a pleasure. Thank you very much.
breakage of ecology at Adai. This research is in collaboration with INERJ and SMER, so as someone said before, a real, real, realistic interdisciplinary work. And is a result of a project that was already finished, uh, but uh, we are still uh, working on it. So I'm going to talk about eco-efficiency in early design decisions, a multi-methodology approach. Uh, my name is Carla Fulig, that's what I'm saying. I'm a researcher at, at the Center for Industrial Ecology. So basically the motivation for this work is uh, related with the decision makers and the lack of tools that decision makers usually have to have informed decision about the products and, and systems, particularly in early design stages. Because we know that in early design stages is there where we have the opportunity to make more decisions. But the problem is that at, is specific at that, uh, that uh, early stage where we have limited information and the potential of reducing environmental impacts and costs are greater. And it is important for decision makers to develop efficient product, products. And another aspect that is a problem at this stage is that usually these, the, the tools and the methodologies uh, used for this, uh, this assessment are, are resource intensive and time intensive and, uh, and people don't have the skills to, to work with this, with this tool. So it is important to give them a tool that, it, it, that give them robust results and uh, overcome the costly and time, and time intensive resources of of having uh, robust decisions at this stage. So, we develop a novel decision supporting methodology approach exactly to overcome this, this problem, to assess the environmental impacts and costs of early design stages, aiming at providing informed decisions to designers, manufacturers, or decision makers. This methodology combines a streamlined life cycle assessment, environmental and cost life cycle that was developed during my PhD thesis, so this, this, is, this is a continuation of that, uh, that uh, work. And, and this, this approach uh, works precisely with the, the problem of working with the, uh, LCA, which is a very resource and time intensive um, uh, methodology. And with this streamlined approach, we provide robust and uh, effective results uh, at early design stage with very little information. Uh, and this, this, this multi methodology approach aims to combine this previous work with uh, another broader approach, which is eco efficiency. We want to provide eco efficiency results and not only environmental impacts and costs. And then we combine with that in all the analysis precisely to give us an eco efficient indicator and with linear regression in order to identify those variables and those parameters at early design stage that give us and that, that give, have higher impact on eco efficient so we can work on specific variables and specific parameters at an early design stage. And one of the, the, the systems that actually had this problem with uh, a lot of information is buildings. Buildings are complex systems and by working with uh, life cycle sets of buildings for some years now, we understand that we have a lot of information and a great amount of information and we may take a year in order to, to, to develop a life cycle study of, of the building. So this was a, 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 a great challenge and we wanted to use this specific uh, example of buildings to validate and to demonstrate this uh, uh, novel approach. And we used the buildings retrofit, which, which is a, a, a one of the, the hotspots of buildings uh, nowadays. And we wanted to give several decision makers perspectives, a, long, a short perspective, a short term perspective and a long term perspective. So we created different scenarios in order to validate the, this tool. And we also, it was a, a, a suggestion of one of the reviewers to work on these decarbonization, decarbonization scenarios, which is kind of a hot spot nowadays. And uh, it was actually a, 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 an interesting exercise and we had interesting results. So very quickly, this is, this is kind of an interactive process, so the goal is to identify which parameters are the most influential and then is, is refining those parameters and specifying those parameters and understand what really impacts 
air coefficients in building retrofitting. And then we can reduce the number of information that we need in order to have uh, robust results. And this is a, a very quick result, so we can have different, several interactions in order to, to achieving the, the number of variables and the parameters that we want to identify and we need to refine. And for instance, we can identify the first interaction that the exterior wall insulation thickness is one of the most influential attributes, and we keep specifying those attributes until we have uh, a robust result and, and ideally to, to, to decrease the, the uncertainty of our results and have good results too for decision makers too and give them feedback on what are the real things that are important when we are dealing with early stages of building retrofits. So basically which, which results and information this tool can have, can give us. So the, our main goal is to have, to have information about the coefficient, so we have a coefficient indicator about a wide solution space that we have of, of different building retrofit options. And then if the tool identifies and says that one specific variable is the most influential, we, we, uh, we, we try to divide that, that variable into three intervals in order to understand which is the interval that most influences the results, meaning that gives us a, a higher echo efficiency, and we keep, we keep uh, refining that, uh, that uh, variable until we decide to lower the interval or to define that one specific solution or one specific variable, one specific thickness, would be the ideal and would be the one that gives us a very efficient result. And for instance, for the validation of this tool, for this specific uh, uh, article, we decided that we, we are going to, to perform three iterations in order to, to achieve the three most influential variables. So we, uh, and, and understand if we could increase the echo efficiency and understand which are the relevant variables and the relevant parameters, building parameters that we need to define at an early design stage. So basically, when we, with this demonstration and validation, we, we concluded that we actually could increase the echo efficiency indicator as we keep refining the parameters, as we, as we are identifying the most influential parameters. We also identify which are the most influential parameters that would help decision makers to understand what are the, the important decisions to have at an early design stage. And the, the, the question about the decarbonization scenarios made us understand that they may have, the most influential attributes may change if we change this uh, the, the, uh, for, for different decarbonization scenarios as an, an optimistic one where we, where we reduce 90% of the GG emissions of the electricity mix or if we are a more conservative one and we, we say that we only reduce 30% by 2015 of the GEG emissions. And it, it was interesting to understand that they, they can change the result and may have an influence on the results. So basically this was it. This was very quick, five minutes. This is quite complex <laughs> research, but I hope that this was for a multidisciplinary audience and you would understand at least the goal of the research. And like we said, I can take this opportunity to say that it was a really a pleasure to meet Professor Daniel Diesel and to work with him within the management committees of here in FES. I will take this for life. Environmental impacts, so 
from the streamlined approach, we have several environmental indicators and uh, the, the, the cost indicator that in this, in this case we use the net present value. And the idea is to combine both environmental and cost indicators, several categories that, that can depend and user can choose which indicator they want to, to use in order to have uh, a net efficiency indicator of term value. Uh, that's why we use it, that in value analysis, which also was used in another project. Uh, actually, it's, it's, it, I think it works for this, as, as we cannot say which weights are, or which categories are the most important. Uh, it, it was a, a way to, to understand and to combine both. Uh, in Because as we say, environmental, environmental, the to reduce environmental costs is very important. And the people say, and what about the costs? It's always something that, and this gives us uh, an overview on how can we combine both, both by, uh, by minimizing environmental impacts and costs. Thank you very much. 